So hopefully most of you are familiar with our company, Intel, uh, or at least heard of us. Um, we have just celebrated our 50th anniversary and we are proud to be part of enabling most of the important technology innovations that have occurred uh, in the last many decades. And as we look towards the future, we see data being at the center of everything, how we live, how we work, how we play. And so I'm gonna spend uh, the next few minutes just talking about really how we need to move, store, and process all that data and the role that 5G plays in accelerating uh, that uh, move, store process, as well as the leadership position that the US needs to play to continue to drive 5G forward. So I'm going to talk a bit about what's happened in the infrastructure. Um, if you look over that period of time from 2005 to 2016, sort of that 10 year window of time, the cloud service providers really mastered the art of taking computing and uh, virtualizing that and really tapping into the uh, almost unlimited computing that you had and the benefits of server volume economics. They mastered that in their computing platforms, in their storage platforms, and in their networking. And they took advantage of the virtualization of that underlying infrastructure to share that across many different customers, use cases, and applications. And what we've seen now in the last several years, and this is work that we've done in conjunction with our customers, uh, several of which were here today, Nokia and Ericsson, great partners of ours, as well as with the customer's customers. So at and and Verizon certainly have been leaders in terms of network cloudification. And this idea that you're actually moving now the, the computing capability in that cloud as an architecture and cloud as a business model uh, from centralized data centers now throughout the core of the network uh, into the edge and out into the access layer as well. And the reason for that is that much of the data that's created wants to be processed and dispositioned at this edge of the network. Uh, that's for reasons of latency, that's for reasons of security, that's for reasons of bandwidth uh, and cost, um, and that's for enabling use cases that either technically were not possible before or were not commercially viable at scale. So what we see is this, uh, this need to bring the compute much, much closer to that point of data creation and data consumption, much, much closer to the point of service delivery. And this is what we call the cloudification of the network. And the benefits that that brings you now, of course, is that you have compute that's locally available to you to do all types of new capabilities beyond running the network workloads to host applications and to really turn all of that data that's being collected there into valuable insights and to turn it into uh, data or insights that could be mined by the upstream content providers or the downstream um, consumers of that, that data. And those consumers, of course, are, are folks like you and I on our very familiar devices, our phones, our PCs, our laptops. But increasingly with 5G, it'll be the tens of billions of things that are connected. The drones and the robots and the manufacturing equipment and, of course, the cars. So. Uh, so this cloudification of the network is happening, the compute is getting closer and closer to the endpoints, and the opportunity to turn all that data and mine it into valuable insights is really one of the big drivers behind many of the use cases that have been discussed uh, here today. And one data point you might not be aware of is that in the last two years alone, 50% of the world's data has been created. But out of all of that data, only 2% has been analyzed. Only 2% have we done anything really useful uh, with. And so this, when we look forward to having virtually unlimited compute network storage and analytics now throughout that entire network infrastructure, you can imagine that we'll be able to enable all types of applications and use cases that we were not really able to deliver before. So, uh, so we've been talking quite a bit about use cases here uh, today. And, uh, and I'll focus on a few that we've been working on with our partners. Um, media and entertainment, including sports, is one of those areas that, again, from a consumer perspective, is uh, one of the few sets of use cases where we're actually willing to part with more of our money. 
Um, in fact, uh, cloud gaming gets brought up a lot, and I know how frustrated I get with my kids when they're using my real money to buy fake weapons in their game. Um, but they do. And if you look at what we've been able to do in terms of smart venues with uh, Nokia and Verizon, the ability to have live streaming and to shorten the delay from 30 seconds down to just a half a second, that's a 60x improvement um, that you're delivering in terms of Again, more processing in that edge of the network at that venue and giving you an 80% improvement in backhaul costs or 80% savings in backhaul costs. So when we look at, thank you, um, uh, another uh, uh, example of a sports uh, use case. So Intel is an Olympic sponsor. And last year in Pyeongchang, we stood up the world's largest uh, 5G network at scale. This was 3,800 terabytes of network capacity. It was over 22 uh, live links over 10 different sites with thousands of people experiencing it. And we were doing things like personalized, uh, uh, more immersive experience of the Olympics, following your athlete, um, being uh, within the, the skating rink, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, and the first seat or the best seat in the house. You, you didn't have to uh, necessarily compromise when you could either wear a headset or just on your device, really see the venue from uh, your vantage point. So lots and lots of excitement in media and entertainment. Smart retail is another use case that we're very excited about because increasingly we see that, uh, that retailers want to deliver a more personalized, more immersive experience. And the ability to, again, run data analytics and AI uh, allows you to have more personalized experience where you're identified as either a, you know, um, a very good shopper at Nordstrom's, for example, uh, or, um, or just knowing that you are uh, an older uh, woman or a younger gentleman or a child, you'll have tar targeted advertising or promotions that are really dedicated to you. So that's one of the ways that retail is trying to personalize the experience. But another thing that's enabled when you don't have um, wireline, when you're actually able to deliver capabilities wirelessly, is the opportunity to just build pop-up stores anywhere. Any venue, any concert, any sporting event, to have a pop-up capability that you otherwise would need to physically lay infrastructure in order to enable. And that creates not only the opportunity to bring retailing to many, many different venues at a lot lower cost, it's also an opportunity now that you have technology within that retail operation to have a frictionless experience, to be able to gather the things that you want to purchase and then walk out without having to stop at the cash register to, to be emailed your receipt because all of that is happening digitally um, using technology. We talked a lot about industrial applications today, so I won't uh, focus there, other than to say that in industrial, there are so many opportunities to improve the efficiency of the manufacturing line. One of the ways that we're doing that is with computer vision and edge inference capability. Again, bringing that compute locally, um, really starting to connect all of those disparate systems that are in a manufacturing floor. I like to say it's sneaker net, right? One system, one person, you know, running from one system to the other, communicating with each other. But with 5G, because of the high bandwidth and the low latency, we're able to use computer vision to see the manufacturing line, to be able to pick out defective or flawed components uh, right out of the line in real time and continue with the flow and have much, much better production and much higher quality downstream. And then finally, with automotive, in fact, we have uh, one of the demonstrations uh, back in the, in the area where we're showing some of the capabilities of 5G, where uh, clearly we need that edge capability enabled by high bandwidth and low latency uh, 5G. So for a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, um, one of the things that you need is very, very fast response. And in the previous slide where I was showing that uh, data center, the core of the network, uh, the edge and the access, that round trip time can be 100 milliseconds. Maybe if it's a good connection or it's not so far away, it's 80 milliseconds. Maybe it even gets as good as 60 milliseconds. But in order to do vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications and breaking in time to not create an accident, um, you need to have as little as three milliseconds. So that can only be possible when you have that compute much, much closer to that autonomous vehicle. 
Um, I just want to close with uh, talking a bit about the, the theme of today, which is, you know, what does it take for us to build on the leadership that we already have in 5G in the U.S.? And certainly, when we look back in time, we, we saw that between that period of 2004 to 2011, we were not the leaders in, in 2G or 3G, and the, the growth that we had in wireless-related uh, jobs, wireless uh, technology jobs, was only 4%. But in a much more compressed window between 2011 and 2014, we were the leaders. And we saw the wireless jobs increase by 84%. And wireless jobs tend to be you know, as much as 50% higher paying jobs than the average uh, job in the US. So, uh, so we talked about earlier the economic uplift, the, the 100 billion extra in GDP that that created for the US. And clearly, um, I think just this week, uh, the CTIA released this, this report around the economic uplift of almost $400 billion that can be delivered by 5G and the almost 2 million jo new jobs that we'll create. So when we look at the leadership position that we had with 4G as a, as a country and all of the industries that were spawned and all of the new capabilities that we enabled for uh, new applications and services that we could not foresee when we started that journey. We could not foresee the Ubers and the Netflix and the Airbnb and the Spotify. But in fact, all that happened because we created that environment where we were attracting the best engineers, the best architects, the investment and the entrepreneurs. We need to do that same uh, run that same playbook with 5G. And of course, it starts with spectrum, and the mid-band spectrum is so critical. Of course, it starts with a, a policy and an environment that invites the best engineers, best architects, and that investment. So uh, the US set the pace for global innovation with 4G. We can continue to build on our leadership in 5G and lead the world and accelerate uh, the race uh, to 5G. Thank you so much. <laughs>